Okay, so uh, we're going to spend uh, a little bit of time on Thursday, or a lot of time on Thursday, talking about domestic laws that uh, facilitate decision making or structure decision making, uh, mostly on the order of around the theme of uh, NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act. And we aren't going to, because we don't have any international cases, spend a lot of time on international law, but I think it, it, it it's worthy uh, to spend a little time on it, for, particularly for those of you who are interested in, in this. Um, and we'll think about uh, CITES in particular, the Convention on the International Trade in Endangered Species. And of course, uh, we have a tension here in that, um, uh, on the one hand, uh, we want to have these global compacts that allow us to all work together as a world. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we individual countries exert their right to not be told what to do by other countries. And so it's dancing this fine line. And surely this is a common perception in the United States is the United States wants to be the master of its own domain and not have the United Nations dictate to it what, what, you know, what we do in this country. And that's a problem in other countries as well. So there are uh, some uh, different forms of public international laws. Uh, there are customary laws, uh, international laws. Uh, these are consistent with state practice, uh, accompanied by uh, a jury's opinions. And there are globally accepted uh, standards of behavior. And so, uh, and then we have these codifications of uh, conventional agreements, and these are usually termed treaties. Um, so the Article 13 of the United Nations obligates the UN Generally, General Assembly to initiate studies and make recommendations to encourage these kinds of uh, things. So there's an international card of law, for example, and, and one country can take another country or people can take a business to court in an international uh, court of law, and that uh, this then is often something that people would rather not do because it tends to be a, a relatively weak court in terms of um, uh, enforcement. Uh, but there are now uh, a Stockholm, the Stockholm Declaration really set the standard uh, back in 1970, I think it was, uh, for uh, thinking about uh, how countries should engage with one another to behave in, on this global stage, and that they, in this uh, declaration, they agreed upon a number of things, including that human rights must be asserted, uh, and that you know, this then runs into problems with conservation periodically because it's sometimes uh, human rights and uh, preventing humans from doing things that they want to do on, in habitats that are, run, are, are in conflict. Uh, developing countries need assistance and that governments should plan their own appropriate population uh, policies, etc. So it, it, it recognizes the right for autonomy. Uh, there are a whole bunch of international treaties and conventions on the environment, and uh, you know, the, the Ramsar on wetlands, and CITES on the trade in endangered species. Um, many of these started in the 1970s, the 1980s, then in the 1990s we have the Convention on Biological Diversity and the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. But we're going to focus on CITES. Uh, it started in 1973. If you look around the world, uh, the number of countries that belong is enormous. The green countries on this map all belong, the white ones do not. And so even new countries that have emerged have generally joined into this, um, uh, into this uh, accord. And that 97% uh, of the world's population falls under, under CITES. There's a whole history of international uh, rules and regulations that tried to uh, get at this idea that species is one of the ways that uh, individual countries can harm or help uh, it, each other. And there was a fur seal convention that was trying to divvy up how fur, fur, fur seals uh, were handled and try and preserve fur seals for um, the masses for all the different countries. The Con International Convention on Whaling is a similar kind of thing. Um, and then in the 1969-70, you get start getting endangered species sorts of things. But uh, the Convention on the International Trade in Endangered Species is really about trade. And so it's not saying that a country can't cause the, it willfully cause the extinction of a species. It merely says um, that uh, the world can agree that trading in a species is problematic to its continued existence. And we'd like all the countries to help constrain uh, the export of these materials to individual countries from countries that would like to conserve these species and are having difficulty doing it. Now, that's easy when it's individual country endemics. It's a little harder when you have things like African elephants that are roam, roam in many different countries and that there are places where they're endangered and other places where they're not. 
Uh, the rhino has uh, taken prominent uh, center stage in this uh, debate uh, recently in that uh, rhino's horn has become exceedingly valuable and that all the rhinos are in, at risk of poaching and it costs countries an awful lot of money uh, to patrol against poaching. And so there have been different suggestions on how you might alleviate hunting pressure on, on rhinos around the world. This is uh, beyond the fact that in Southeast Asia in particular, um, the ha habitat loss has been a big problem for rhinos. Uh, so they're valued for their ground horn. I'm going to try and go by this fairly quickly. The poaching rates have gone up quite a lot. And it's on the Appendix 1, and I'll talk about that in a minute, which is a blacklist, which means that no trade is allowed. There are three lists. Uh, Appendix 2 uh, says all species not necessarily now threatened with extinction may become so unless trade is subject to strict legislation. And in this pl uh, case, CITES uh, sets quotas and says how many of these indivi you know, individuals of a species may be traded. Appendix 3 is a minor, you know, uh, sparsely used thing. It lists species that are uh, unilaterally by parties as being subject to regulation within their jurisdiction for which international cooperation is, is needed. So again, this is usually single country endemics and the country is just enlisting the world's help and trying to reduce the amount of trade. Appendix 1, there's, these are the blacklist species, dugong, grebe zebra, Arabian oryx, uh, greater, great hornbill. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, big uh, common, you know, big uh, profile species are on this do not trade list. Uh, there's a remarkable breadth and diversity and number of species on Appendix 2, uh, including the African elephant and things like the bald eagle. Hang on just a second. Okay, sorry, I was interrupted there. So um, the point here is that there are a lot of species in here um, that you wouldn't necessarily think would be subject to trade, um, but that uh, they then have quotas on trade. Um, okay, so in uh, Appendix 3, uh, um, well, I won't go into this much. So what's the structure of the of CITES? There is a conference of the parties. This uh, countries elect um, or appoint people to attend the conferences. There are standing committees. These all report to the secretariat. The secretariat's tiny, maybe 20 or 30 people whose job it is just to make sure that this whole thing runs. Uh, there are committees, uh, animals and plants, that report then to these conferences of the party and the committee that vote and set the rules on how much trade in different species should be allowed. And this all reports to the United Nations. So it's mostly then just you know a bookkeeping thing that, in, you know, notice there's no, nothing in here for enforcement, that uh, countries are expected to deploy their own enforcement of CITES, that there's nothing in CITES, uh, there's no body that uh, does um, enforcement. So conferences of the parties uh, meet every three years to tackle major issues. Committees routinely meet to make recommendations, and that modifications by committee become recommendations taken up at the next conference of the parties or COP. And that, uh, a, a, uh, that these, uh, this appendix to our operates largely on export permits. So there are things that you are required to have a permit to take it out of a country, and that bringing into a country is a different sort of thing, and that, therefore, places like the United States uh, would like to put th some things on the endangered species list because that makes it easy for them, easier for them to control uh, import. So there's these do not trade lists, uh, there's a global database of all these things, um, and, and that uh, di various species uh, fluctuate back and forth between uh, Appendix 1 and Appendix 2. So there's a, a large number of countries who think the only way to really control ivory trade for both the Asian and African elephant is to prohibit all trade because it's very difficult to tell where the ivory from a particular elephant came from. On the other hand, there are countries where uh, um, elephants are becoming a nuisance species. They're, they're so common and so you get Kenya and Tanzania which are trying to restrict the trade on elephants lining up against Botswana and South Africa, I think I believe it is, that think want to have a controlled and restricted trade on elephants. Uh, and um, anyway, well, this is a news item from some poaching, poachers being caught last year. Um, so there are many examples of assessment of these and regulation challenges. They come out uh, every year and they mostly say, you know, it's been very, very difficult to uh, control this trade. And I think it's this uh, Carpenter et al. 2014 that I'll show next, meat trade in amphibian remains a substantive international industry. And this is a very interesting um, um, 
trade item and that you think of a lot of the Southeast Asian uh, countries uh, consuming turtles and frogs more so than people in North America and Europe and that the turtles and frogs of those countries are in trouble because of human consumption. Uh, but um, it's a global world and uh, this was an assessment of trade and it shows that just an awful lot of um, the CITES uh, exports are moving to Europe and North America. And this has been a, a real problem uh, for CITES and why uh, it's important for the U.S. to engage the Endangered Species Act in CITES enforcement because so many of these things that are being traded around the world are, are ending up here. So the, and here's the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, Office of Law Enforcement uh, importing and exporting commercial wildlife shipment that you have to have permits and talk about and, and, and document where the thing came from and you're complying with um, uh, CITES. Now, as we all know, uh, not everything's declared and not everything is caught once, uh, you know, in the effort to come in through the borders. And so it's a very leaky border at the, in the U.S., uh, probably even more so in most other countries around the world. I'm um, sorry that uh, this just a this was uh, a slide presentation I did for other things. So there's a few things that are stray in here. Just goes to say that Congress has taken up the plight of particular individual species uh, periodically through time, and uh, and passed legislation that tries to strengthen the enforcements of importation so as to assist the effort uh, more broadly. Um, and uh, the problem here is that um, rhino horn becomes very, very valuable, and it may be that the penalties associated with violating the law aren't commensurate with uh, the value to the poachers, and as a consequence, people are willing to, to, to go to do this. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, CITES has no police arm, uh, but there are a number of uh, organizations like Traffic, uh, whose job it is solely as a nonprofit is to help monitor and control uh, trade in endangered species. And so there are other organizations that try and help CITES, uh, for, particularly in countries where they don't have uh, very secure border patrols or very good mechanisms for permitting. Uh, the big NGOs also participate in this, that now uh, during this uh, rhino crisis there's been a lot of work by certain NGOs, like here is uh, a people, uh, you know, ranger up in the upper right sleeping with a baby rhino, rangers out patrolling for poachers with the World Wildlife Fund uh, logo on their side, and so there's a, a ver and the upper left with the rangers is a, a program where the w, uh, WF is paying for rangers in an African country to patrol for poachers. But because of the, the money, the poachers are, are very sophisticated hunting with drones and helicopters and things like this. It's very rough business. Uh, anyway, uh, the CITES Secretary uh, General, they met just recently. This, I think, is 2015, was a, a year for their uh, revising their quotas and things. Um, and that the Secretary, uh, its job is to inform and lobby countries to impose adequate criminal penalties for violations. Uh, of import and uh, export. And as I mentioned, that uh, we have a problem with rhinos and, and also with tigers. And the consequence of this is uh, people have made suggestions that maybe we should be taking a different approach than not trying to regulate uh, or restrict the trade. So uh, finally, uh, there's a more fundamental problem to CITES, and that is that uh, there are species, for example, like the rhino and tigers, where um, Poaching and exploitation may be a, pr a primary driver of extinction and threat. However, um, you know even the the southeastern Asian southeastern Asian rhinos are are easily equally threatened by habitat loss. And if habitat loss is the number one driver of extinction risk, society does absolutely nothing um, for that. Hence, we need the Convention on Biological Diversity. And that's I'm running up to 15 minutes, and so maybe sometime later in the quarter we'll do a nice little thing like this on the Convention on Biological Diversity as well. All right, see you Thursday.